Well, it's a great honor to be able to preach here at University of Presbyterian Church. And uh, George asked me to preach on two different texts, chapter 4 and chapter 5 of the book of Romans, because he's in the midst of a series of studies of the book of Romans. I love that book, so I was glad to take on that challenge for today and next Sunday. Next Sunday, chapter 5. Today, chapter 4. As you know, the book of Romans begins, it is a book about the gospel. And he begins uh, in the beginning of Romans with an amazing statement, a, a kind of like a, 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 a theme sentence for the entire book of Romans. Paul says in Romans 1, 16, I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation to everyone who has faith to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God, that means the righteous character of God, is revealed. Now, here Paul uses the very strong word, apocalypsis, means breaks through by surprise. The righteousness of God has broken through by surprise. His faithfulness for our faith. And then Paul, like a good rabbi, gives a text. He has a text, it's from the book of Habakkuk. The just shall live by the faithfulness of God. And that is the whole book of Romans, really, is, a, is an exploration of this amazing good news. Heavenly Father, bless us today as we explore the good news. And may the words of my mouth, the meditations of our hearts, be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. The Jew first and also the Greek. Well, very early in the book of Romans, Paul decides to actually uh, handle that. Like he says in the third chapter, is the gospel for the Jews only? He says, oh no. And now he comes back to his original statement. No, no, uh, not, not the Jews only, also the Greeks. And then he has to discuss Abraham because Abraham is the way... God is described in the Old Testament and also parts of the New Testament. We describe God in the Bible. In fact, Moses, when Moses is called into action, who shall I say sent me? The God of our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob is the word Israel. So that is the way the, the, the very identity of God is identified in the Old Testament. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so uh, if that's the case, Paul now decides in the fourth chapter of Romans, after he's answered the question in the third chapter that it's faith that counts and faith is the most important thing, and that would be for the Jew first because they chronologically heard the gospel first and also the Greek. So... Uh, he wants us to understand the width, the, uh, the expanse of this good news, and he does it in the fourth chapter. Uh, notice uh, this wonderful verse that we want to look at now as our main text in the fourth chapter. He says, for this reason, the, the gospel depends on faith in order that the promise may rest in and find its source in grace. Now he's going to add grace to faith. This is going to become very important. In fact, grace becomes the most important word. Our faith responds to God's grace. But God's grace, God's love is the primary is the primary theme. And Paul's going to prove it actually uh, by the way he discusses uh, Abraham. Uh, Faith is important. Abraham had faith, but his faith was laying hold of grace. It's grace that is the most important word. Now listen as he goes on. So for this reason, it depends on faith in order that the promise may originate, rest, and stand on grace and be guaranteed to all his descendants, not only to the adherents of the law, that would be the Jews, but also to those who share the faith of Abraham, for he is father of us all. 
as it is written. And now Paul quotes Genesis, the 17th chapter. In the 17th chapter, after Abraham has received his, the call, and that's the 12th chapter of Genesis, and he gets his call to be a blessing, and he's going to be blessed, and he's going to be a blessing to others. And in that call, he gets his name changed by God from Abram, which is the Babylonian name that he had, to Abraham. And in getting his new name, Abraham, God adds this word, and Paul now quotes it. God says to Abraham, I have made you the father of multitudes of nations. Now, the Greek word for nation is the Greek word ethnos. So it means it's all the ethnic groups of the world. I've made you the father of all the nations, of the, multi, of the multitude of nations. So right there in the Genesis account itself, and Paul wants us to know that, so he quotes it in chapter 4 of Romans. And so let's look at that and explore that, how grace is the foundation and the fundamental truth upon which faith responds. Abraham uh, has two sons. The first son is Ishmael. Ishmael was born from Hagar, who was a slave in Abraham's house. And he is the first son of Abraham, born when Abraham was 86 years old. By the way, his name in Hebrew, every Jewish boy's name means something. It's, the name is symbolic. So his name is God Hears. God hears us. That is his name, Ishmael. And then 14 years later, a second son will be born, Isaac, who is born to the wife of Abraham, Sarah. When Sarah heard that she was going to have a child, she laughed, and she laughed unto the Lord. And so the name that Isaac gets is the name he laughed. So that is the name Isaac. He's born 14 well, 13 years later. And both of these boys, Ishmael and Isaac, are going to grow up and have a full career and full life. I need to tell you that before these harrowing things happen next. You need to know they both are going to survive and become so that the God of Abraham will be called the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Ishmael and, and Isaac are going to survive and in fact, it's an interesting thing that in, in Genesis 25, we hear about the death of Abraham. And this interesting line appears in describing the death of the great Abraham after living a long life. Abraham breathed his last, died in a good old age. And then his sons, Isaac and Ishmael, buried him. So they are, they, they're able to play that role with their father. Abraham is able to uh, know them and know these young men, Ishmael and Abraham. And if you track the two young men, though, they both, these two young men, uh, Ishmael and Abraham, each face catastrophic dangers as young boys. And for each, it'll be the grace of God, not the faith of their father, not the faith of their mother or uh, the faith of anybody around them, but it'll be the kind of interruption. It'll be for both boys. The marker will be the grace of God that intervenes to save them, to bless them. And that's preserved in, even in the Genesis account. And so that's what Paul has in mind. So both boys face catastrophic dangers as young boys. First, Ishmael. Ishmael, because in, when, Ab when Isaac is born to Sarah, Sarah uh, sees the two boys uh, in, the, in the house, uh, Ishmael being now 14, and her son Isaac, just a little one-year-old or little baby, and she becomes jealous and she becomes resentful of this boy Ishmael, the oldest son, because now there's a rival to Isaac, who she loves and treasures. And so she uh, prevails upon Abraham to have Ishmael and, and Hagar, his, his mother, expelled from the house. 
It's not something that Abraham should be proud of, and he wasn't proud of, but he did it. He, in fact, the text says he loved Ishmael, but his wife was so suspicious of Hagar and this new boy in the family that uh, this sounds a little bit like what happens in other ancient uh, civilizations and other ancient kingdoms. Uh, it, may, it gets you ready a little bit for when the birth of our Lord happens and Herod hears that a new king is being born. And so it makes him jealous and fearful and the need then to get rid of that king. So it actually happens that Ishmael and his mother are put into the desert. And the, the text in, in, in Genesis is very specific but very moving. Uh, they're in the desert and they've run out of water. And she sits and lists her voice in, in weeping. And she's, uh, she's uh, sure that she's going to watch the death of her son because they're both out of water. And then an angel appears to them. God's angel appears and says, what troubles you, Hagar? Do not be afraid, for God has heard the voice of the boy and where he is. Notice, his name is God Hears, which is interesting, isn't it? He hears the voice of your boy. He has heard the voice of your son. And so don't be afraid. He has heard the voice. Come, lift up the boy. Hold him uh, fast with your hand. For I, and now comes the blessing to Ishmael. For I will make a great nation of him. So one of these nations that Abraham is called the father of is the nation of Ish which Ishmael will be the father of and you'll have to track that in the book of Genesis and through, throughout the Old Testament. So I will make him a great nation. And, uh, and then God opened the eyes of, of, of Hagar and she saw a well of water. And they went and filled the skin with water and gave it to the boy to drink. So that was a catastrophic beginning. But the act of grace... The act of grace is the key, the key item to watch for in that scene. Now Isaac. Isaac, whose name is Laughter, he now is a, a young lad, a, a, a little few years later, a young lad. And in Genesis 22, a very famous and dreadful uh, question is posed to Abraham and and. In, and an instruction to Abraham where the Lord says that I, I want you to take your son. And, uh, I, I, and, so, and so he says, uh, and he says, Abraham, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains that I will show you. Yeah, you know, it, the religions of that time in, in ancient Babylon and all of those Canaanite religions as well practiced the, the tra tragedy, practiced child sacrifice. They did it in the, in the building of buildings and stuff like that. And once in a while, it happens also with the Jewish kings. But it's interesting from this moment on, that will be called an abomination to God. An abomination when... Uh, Ahab or other kings practice uh, child sacrifice. It's against the will of God. So that becomes very clear. But right now, there is this test where Abraham is to take his son to Mount Moriah. And so uh, I'll read a little of that text. When they arrive at Mount Moriah, Abraham said to the young men, stay here with the donkey. The boy and I will go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Now, that's interesting. That is, uh, when Paul talks about Abraham, he said, Paul, that Abraham hoped against hope that something would happen. And so that's the hope against hope. It's not a great hope, but he's saying, uh, even there, hoping that something will happen so that uh, the, uh, we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood and the burnt offering and laid it on his son Isaac, and he himself carried the, the knife and the fire. And the two of them walked together. Now, Isaac begins to quiz his father. 
like obviously Ishmael was concerned when he was running out of water. So Isaac said to his father, Abraham, father, he said, here I am, my son. And the, Abraham answers, and he said, the fire and the wood are here, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And then Abraham gives another kind of hope against hope answer to his son, uh, Isaac. He says, God himself will provide the lamb for a burnt offering my son. So the two of them walked on together. Then they came to the place that God had shown him, and then Abraham built an altar. He puts Abraham on the altar, and then an amazing interruption occurs. Uh, They find a, a ram caught in the thicket, and they're able then to sacrifice that ram on the altar, and then Abraham and his son were able to run down Mount Moriah. They trudged up Mount Moriah, almost like a, a, a typical religious act, being a, a terrible religious act. You know, Pascal is the one who said, men never delight in doing evil as much as if they can do it for religious reasons. And here's an evil being done for religious reasons. And they are going up the mountain. And then there's this amazing interruption that will have amazing results in, in, even in the life of Israel because whenever Molech is, is practiced, it's called an abomination from then on. But here they are. Uh, in, in 1630, one of the Dutch masters named Peter Lassman painted a famous painting called The Sacrifice of Isaac in which the father Abraham has his bound son on an altar and then he has a knife in his hand and the angel of the Lord is, it looks like in Peter Lastman's painting in 1630, as if God is wrestling or the angel is wrestling with Abraham as if he's determined to do this terrible religious act and he has the knife in his tight grip of his hand. In 1635, a better painter, a greater painter, the greatest of all painters of biblical scenes, uh, Rembrandt von Rijn, decided to copy, he did this several times, he copied paintings by other painters, like his Sea of Galilee was copied, but he improved it greatly over what the earlier painter had done. Uh, Now, he copies Lassman's painter, but he makes amazing change in the painting. And Rembrandt's painting becomes a gospel painting. Lassman's painting becomes a battle of one religious person being battled with by the angel uh, with this helpless boy. But in Rembrandt's painting, he paints the scene when God, the angel says, Abraham, that's in the text. The angel says to Abraham, Abraham. And in Rembrandt's painting, he has the grieving Abraham looking but with hope. And the knife has been thrown far away from the, far away from the, the altar. Abraham, and the moment he heard his name, he threw the knife away. He knew that God was going to do something that was new, and he did. And so uh, we have this amazing act of grace that begins the book of Romans. And Paul wants it to begin with Abraham, begins with this Abraham who hoped against hope, and then this amazing sacrifice occurred. Uh, You know, Mount Moriah is only a little less than four miles from a hill called Golgotha. And at that hill, Jesus Christ will lay his life down in our behalf. He will be the lamb. The lamb who forgives our sins and takes upon himself our wrong and the wrongdoing we've done, takes upon himself the power of evil and takes upon himself death. And he disarms all three And it happens at the cross by Jesus Christ. Next week, when we look at Romans 5, St. Paul will amazingly uh, point the power of that event. But right now, you need to know it, that there were two signs of God's grace given, and they were given early on, given to Abraham and to Abraham's two boys. The one sign was water. And it's interesting, isn't it, how universal that sign is, a sign of grace and a sign of hope. In fact, our Lord, in the eighth chapter of John, uh, 
just a, 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 two or three days before a Thursday night rest in the garden, Jesus says to the crowd, if you're thirsty, come to me and I will give you water. And out of you will flow fountains of water from the Holy Spirit. We'll give that to you. And, I, and he promised that. And he, as the Lamb of God, lays his life down. And, and that Lamb is the other sign of grace. The sign of grace is that God takes our place. God interrupts us and takes our place. And those two great signs become the signs that we get to claim because of, uh, of God's fulfillment of his own promise, his fulfillment that he does it not so much through the faith of Abraham, though that's glorified in the Bible that Abraham had faith, ah, but the faith it only makes sense because of the claim on grace. It's grace that is the big news on Mount Moriah. Heavenly Father, thank you for that good, that good news that it's for us today, is for our lives to know that you're, you're the one who gives the sign of water and the sign of the lamb in our behalf. And Lord, thank you for that. And may we claim that with your faith and be grateful for that. In Christ's name we pray, amen.